Welcome to Middlesex Moments from Middlesex Community College in Middletown. I'm Steve Minkler, the college CEO, speaking to you from my home as I record this edition of Middlesex Moments. It's a time when our main campus, our Meriden Center, and all other instructional sites are closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic that is sweeping across our community, our nation, and our world. I'm happy to report that even though our campus might be closed, the college is still open for business in a fully online format. All of our classes remain going in online format, and all of our student support services as well. And with me today, joining me from his home to talk about our veterinary technology program is Dr. Chris Gargamelli. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well, Steve. Thanks for having me this morning. Glad to be here. Now, Chris, uh, you have actually one of our signature programs at the college, which means it's a fairly unique program. There's only three of their kind in the state, and we actually have a leadership role in the vet tech program. And because our campus is closed, how are we doing a program like vet tech where I have to imagine there's a lot of hands-on instruction that needs to happen? So this semester, we were lucky in that we had a lot of our skills front-loaded in the first half of the semester. So for our graduating students, we will be graduating 19 this year. We had a couple of skills left, but luckily we were actually able to mail the students kits in the mail to get the remaining laboratory tests they needed to perform done because the beauty of the vet tech program is every one of our students owns animals. So they were able to get some first samples from their own animals and finish up the couple of skills we had left for them. So we were very lucky about that. That's fantastic. Now, I think for our listeners, why don't you talk a little about where our program takes place? It's both on campus, but also off-site as well. Yeah, so we are lucky in that we have wonderful community partners. Our primary community partner is Piper Veterinary, just two miles down the road in Randolph Road in Middletown. So our students do all of their small animal clinical work there. So they do their surgery and anesthesia rotation there, their laboratory procedures, radiology, and we have our own dedicated space that Piper Veterinary built for us in their basement. So we have our own surgical suite, treatment area, and exam room to use just for the program. Plus, we have access to their state-of-the-art facility. So what a wonderful partnership for us. In addition, even though we're a community college, our students spend time at an Ivy League university. So we use Yale University's laboratory animal facility where our students work with mice and rats and rabbits and learn about the research facility. Plus, we have about a dozen area farms where our students go to and work with cows and goats and horses and llamas and pigs. So really, you know, our program is based on the wonderful clinical partnerships that we have. That's incredible. And our students this way also have a way not just of getting into those facilities, but actually learning alongside veterinarians and veterinary technicians and laboratory technicians. So they're learning from people who uh, our students aspire to be one day. Oh, exactly. And that's really the goal of our program. We're an endpoint career program, meaning that when our students graduate, they go out and they become veterinary nurses. So when they graduate, we always survey area employers and we know what their needs are. And we survey them about our graduates to see you know, where we can improve. So we're constantly trying to fulfill those employment needs and get those students that when they graduate, they can hit the ground running day one. And Middlesex Community College's vet tech program is nationally accredited. We are, and we're actually going through an accreditation cycle, which proves challenges in the time of COVID-19. So we may be looking at a virtual visit for the fall. And could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that for our listeners? What What's the value of an accredited program? So the value is an outside organization, in this case, the American Veterinary Medical Association, is accredited by the <coughs> federal government, the Federal Department of Education, to maintain the quality of both veterinary schools and veterinary technology programs. So we are held to a very high standard. So they held, hold us to standards regarding the academic we teach and also the skills we teach our students. They, we, when our students graduate, there are a very set number of skills they have to complete and we have to prove their competency in those skills so that you know that signature brand proves that our students have met a minimum. But that being said, myself and our program veterinary technician go well above that minimum standard too. And speaking of our program veterinary technician, I'd like to introduce Amy Lawton, who's also joining us from her home. How are you today, Amy? 
I'm, I'm great. Thank you for having me this morning. Now, Amy, as someone who is a veterinary technician, you are training students who wish to become what you are uh, and to have the kind of jobs that you've had. And what's that like for you to be part of a program that is training future technicians? Well, I got to be honest, this time of year is my favorite time of year. Um, looking back at how the students have progressed through the program over the last two years, you know, I spend the most time with the students throughout the program, so I really get to know them. And um, I, you know, because I spend all that time with them, I get to watch them progress from day one, entering the program, being a little bit nervous, a little bit unsure about things, and then just kind of watching them grow and then eventually graduate the program and feeling comfortable that they can actually go out into the workforce um, the day they graduate and be contributing members to the veterinary team as veterinary technicians. So um, this is my favorite time of year. I get so proud of them um, to see how far they've come and how far they've actually worked um, to get where they are. Absolutely. And you guys do a tremendous job with this program. And I think, um, almost all of our students get jobs after they graduate from the program. Is that not right? Yeah, we have 100% job placement for any student that comes to us and needs assistance. We have always found a position for them. Now, in the state of Connecticut, is someone who uh, aspires to be a veterinary technician, is that a licensed field or is this something that, you know, they have to take a test after they graduate? Uh, you know, what kind of gives them that additional seal of approval after graduation? So in order to take the veterinary technician national exam, which is the national standard for examination, you must graduate from an accredited program. So graduating opens that door for our students. One of the goals that myself and my colleagues at the other two community colleges, along with our community partners, such as the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association are working towards is licensure in Connecticut. We're one of the states that actually does not have licensure for technicians. So we hope to elevate the status of our technicians to similar programs at the college, like our radiology technology program or our ophthalmic dispensing and design program, where the students can get a state license once they graduate and pass the national exam. Gotcha. Okay. And um, Amy, uh, before joining the staff at Middlesex Community College, you had worked at Pipers, who is our you know clinical uh, partner in the veterinary technician program. And... Um, I imagine that you play a pretty critical role in making sure that our students have access to the things that they need at Pipers when they're there for their classwork. Yes, um, absolutely. So again, like Dr. Gargamelli mentioned earlier in the program, um, we're very fortunate to have that relationship with Piper Veterinary. Um, students get amazing experience, uh, amazing opportunities, um, spending time in a facility like Piper. Uh, they have a variety of specialty uh, services available, as well as a very, very busy emergency room and intensive care unit. Uh, so keeping my hands on the pulse there is very important so that I can maintain relationships with the staff and doctors there. And that then, you know, helps the program and helps the students get everything they need to out of the program um, in order to, again, go out into the workforce and be you know, contributing members to a veterinary office or facility. Now, in today's era of uh, us all dealing with the COVID-19 virus, uh, I have to imagine that uh, veterinary medicine is also affected by um, you know, either people, uh, but I imagine that we're all affected by this. So in what ways have you seen those changes in the veterinary field right now during this uh, pandemic? So one of the big things that every veterinary hospital that I know of in the state has done is curbside veterinary service. So as you can imagine, we're an essential service. You know, when the uh, governor came out with the list of essential services, we were in the first group just with human healthcare workers along that line. So we were deemed very essential. So we very few veterinary hospitals closed their doors. Some of the very small practices did for a little while, but all the large hospitals and mid-sized hospitals all stayed open throughout this process. But to limit the contact between the staff and the public, what would happen is a, a client would pull into the parking lot with their pet, 
and we would send a single staff member out to get the pet from the car and the client would not come inside the building. So definitely a new way of thinking of veterinary medicine, but definitely a safer approach in the time of the virus. So what that's done is it slowed down the pace a little bit because when you walk into an exam room and have a client, you can talk face to face, make decisions relatively quickly, things along that line, rather than examine the pet, call the owner on the phone, run the diagnostic test, call the owner on the phone again. But we've made the system work. And most veterinary hospitals now have gotten quite efficient and effective at that. And then there's been a couple of other trends that we have seen in the veterinary world. The first is with people being at home, they've come to the conclusion that it is a great time to get and train a dog. So we've actually seen an uptick in both purchases and adoption of pets. And as those numbers increase, so does the demand for veterinary service. Um, so I'd have to think, uh, Chris, that a lot of the measures that were put in place by veterinary practices were to minimize transmission of COVID from human to human. But is there transmission from human to pet or from pets to other pets at this time? Very rare and unusual. So there have been animals that have tested positive. There was three animals in Hong Kong, a couple of domestic house cats here in the US, and then some tigers at the Bronx Zoo. So those are the positives we know of. Honestly, we do not 100% understand the clinical implications of that. So viruses are very species specific. They tend to grab hold of a specific species and love to live there. So right now it's humans. You know, it's, the data shows that it may have started in bats and bats are really unique because they're flying mammals. So that's why a lot of these viruses, when they do jump species, bats is the mechanism for that because they're odd little creatures. But for our domesticated animals, it looks like, you know, while it is theoretically possible and in rare cases can jump the COVID-19 from humans to domestic animals, it is incredibly rare. So the recommendations right now are that, you know, if you happen to be positive in clinical for COVID-19, so actively shedding the virus, it may be prudent to minimize contact with your pet. But otherwise, in any other circumstance, there is such minimal risk that you just go about your day-to-day -day life. Okay, great. Now, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh, and Amy, I want to ask you, I know at the moment the college's plans for the fall are still a little bit up in the air. I think we're going to have a larger mix of online courses in all of our programs. Um, have you been able to you know, work with Dr. Gargamelli and with uh, Pipers to think about ways that parts of this program could be functioning online? Yes, of course. I mean, as soon as the college announced uh, back in March, I think it was that we were going fully online, um, Dr. Agramelli and I started collaborating on ways to actually still run the program and run a, um, an excellent program, knowing the changes that um, were coming down the line. Um, so we've gotten a little bit creative. Um, we've had to, like Dr. Agramelli mentioned, we actually mailed out test kits to the seniors so they could actually graduate this fall. And we're actually now already looking at the fall semester and, and playing out a few different scenarios as, ha as to what may happen um, as we move towards uh, the fall semester. And so working very closely with Piper Veterinary right now, monitoring the situation there and kind of looking at ways to get back uh, into the hospital, get the students uh, the clinical experience they need because for the um, fall semester, this is a very heavy clinical semester. Um, we have the veterinary anesthesia and surgical nursing class along with an imaging class and a laboratory class. So this is a huge hands-on semester for the students. Um, and so we're gonna really need to be creative in ways to get them all the hands-on stuff that they need done for this semester that we kind of lost a little bit of time with. So I imagine the fall semester will be quite jam-packed with hands-on um, procedures and techniques for the students to learn. So we're going to be jumping in uh, feet first, uh, day one, and uh, getting, getting the students what they need to to get done. 
And one of the things that's an advantage for us is that accreditation that we talked about previously has very strict standard for the ratio of students to instructors. So we already have our students divided into smaller groups of either groups of six or eight. So we're already working with a smaller group scenario, which is slightly easier to social distance with. Yeah, that, that's good to know. And I think it's also good for our audience and for our listeners to know that the college is looking at ways that we can reopen in the fall that would allow programs in healthcare, both uh, human and animal health care, as well as our traditional science lab courses, and even some of our studio art courses where there's a lot of hands-on instruction, opening up first for those courses and trying to do a lots of standard lectures online if we can. So, you know, it's, uh, it's still a work in progress, and we hope to have a plan in place you know, within the next couple of weeks, depending on what's happening with the health situation around us all. So I thank you guys for being on top of all that with the veterinary technology program. We make it work. Yeah. That's technician model work. <laughs> and the two of you are frequent guests on this program. And one of our more popular segments is Ask the Veterinarian and Veterinary Technician. So our audience knew this episode was coming. So I do have some actual questions from audience members uh, from Middlesex Moments to pose to you. So I'll just open it up and whoever would like to start with an answer is uh, fine with me. So first from a listener, I have a small dog who is overweight. Any suggestions for food choices to reduce weight? So I think that one, the same principles apply to animals as to people. In order to lose weight, you have to have more calories burned in a day than you take in. So standard combination of things. Exercise is key. And in this time of COVID-19, you know, for a lot of people working from home, there's an opportunity to exercise their animals more often. I know Amy and I regularly chat, you know, I've been taking my dogs on a five mile hike through the woods. And Amy, I think you've been running with yours. Yep, that's right. So, you know, just now I think more than ever, you know, with our lives so disrupted, it's a great opportunity to exercise your animals more. And then in terms of food, you know, there are many lower calorie options. In the veterinary world, you know, dog food and cat food are often labeled weight management. So, you know, that's what's to look for in different brands of food. And also depending on the animal's age, you know, senior foods are lower in calories because they know that as animals age, they slow down. So that, you know, that's the basic premise. Exercise more, less calories in. And I know myself, I love to give my animals treats, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you give a huge giant milk bone, that's a lot of calories. If you give it the little tiny versions, much better. And even better still, a lot of animals like the baby carrots, you know, the little tiny baby carrots, and those mm -hmm. have next to nothing for calories. So those are great options to help your animal lose weight you know so now the veterinarian in me always has to remind people that there are certain medical conditions that can cause them to gain weight such as hypothyroidism so before in starting any weight loss program or if you're concerned that your animal's overweight a veterinary visit is a good place to start great another question now that many people are working from home and maybe their children are doing school from home, has this caused stress and anxiety in our pets that we're home more often? So I think in my case, you know, there's a meme going around Facebook that, you know, you chuckle at and, you know, wouldn't put it by that dogs were the actual creators of COVID-19. That they, <laughs> that, you know, it forced people to be home with them. So that's one meme that I've seen that I think sums it up well is that dogs created it. And then the other meme that I've seen, actually shared by a colleague at the college, is that cats are staring at their owners going, when are you going to get back to work? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't know what you think about your animals, Amy. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a couple of dogs. Um, they are bred to be companion dogs, so they think they've hit the lottery. Um, they are thrilled that I'm home every day. Um, it can be a little bit of a challenge though, because, you know, they don't understand that I, you know, do need to do some work. Um, and I can't be just, um, petting them and spending time with them the whole time. So, you know, I've kind of had to move their dog beds around a little bit so that they can, uh, be near me, um, and, you know, be comfortable, but knowing that, you know, mom does have some work to do and, and the cats too, eh. 
I mean, I have some affectionate cats, so they're pretty happy too, but you know, cats are cats and they like to do their own thing. So, um, you know, I think it's been an adjustment for everybody and I do worry a little bit about the adjustment, um, for the dogs, especially for when I, you know, go back, um, into the, into the hospitals and, and back to the college again, going from being home, um, you know, 24 hours a day, um, to them being gone for several hours in a day. And so kind of, maybe slowly starting to tr just transition that them to those hours, you know, kind of as the semester starts approaching, you know, maybe leaving for a couple hours at a time, coming back, making sure we did okay. And then, mm -hmm. you know, gradually kind of increase that time again that I'm gone. Cause so then I just don't cold turkey them. Um, Cause I think that would be definitely um, stressful for them. So I'm just going to try and make a slow exit um, and back to return of normal hours once the, um, you know, semester rolls around. Speaking of our pet's emotions, another listener writes in, my older dog recently passed away. What can be done to help my other dog cope with the loss of her companion of the past seven years? So that one's always hard because animals do grieve just like people do. So there's a couple of different options out there. So one is to bring another companion into the house. But it has to be both the right decision for the pet owner. They have to be willing to take on the responsibility of another pet and also for the pet that's already in the household. You know, so sometimes introducing a younger animal is much better than introducing an older animal. So bringing a puppy or kitten into the house, you know, animals do recognize babies and young animals compared to older animals and sometimes adapt better to that. But again, it's a big responsibility to take on another animal. So other options are spending a lot more time with your pet that's coping with the loss, you know, keeping them occupied and busy so that they can realize they have other ways to spend their days and readjust. And that's just some of my thoughts. It's not an easy one. So I don't know if Amy has any additional thoughts either. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think, um, you know, they do form bonds and relationships and there is going to be a time um, to grieve. And so, yeah, absolutely spending more time with that, that pet, keeping them on a routine. Um, you know, dogs are a little bit like children, like they like to stay on a routine um, and just, yeah, trying to spend more time with them and, and keep them distracted by doing other uh, activities for a while. Okay. Speaking of activities, here's, in my opinion, a bit of an unusual question, but it sounds kind of fun, actually. A listener writes, we recently started playing YouTube videos of squirrels for our cats. The Siamese especially enjoys them and interacts with the squirrels by swatting at the screen. He now will ask for such screen time by reaching out his paw and touch the TV screen. <laughs> Is there any harm in doing this? <laughs> no, I think it's great. So for especially cats that live strictly indoors, which by the way is the safest option for them, they often redirect their natural instincts in different ways. So for example, both of my cats are the great bug hunters is what we call them in the house. So anything that flies around, they chase and trap and eventually try to eat. So rather than being you know, small rodents and birds, which they don't have access to, they redirect. So I think, you know, some of the hearing the sounds on TV is a way to redirect. One of the things that, you know, when I hear questions like this, it makes me think of is, you know, there's many ways to redirect your cat's hunting abilities. And one of them is to actually use a laser pointer, right? So that darts around and it's something for them to chase. But the key with an object like that or anything you do to play with your cat is at the end, they always need a physical object to grab onto because they need to hunt. They need to feel like they're hunting something. So finding that physical object and grabbing onto it at the end kind of finishes the cycle of that behavior for them. Okay, here's another one, a uh, different species. Is there a way to get rid of bears in your backyard? They visit almost every day. Is there anything that repels them? And this listener actually sent in a photograph of a very large black bear in their backyard. Uh, black bears are becoming more and more common in Connecticut. So there's always a list of do's and don'ts whenever you see wildlife, but particularly bears. So... At the end of the day, you have to realize bears really don't want to be around us. You know, we are not other bears. We make noise. We have cars. They would prefer to be in the woods, but they also get hungry. 
And humans are often an easy food source for bears, not the humans themselves, but rather their garbage, their pet food, their bird feeders, all of the objects that you know we kind of have in our day-to-day -day life, right? You know, so people with bird feeders love to watch the birds come in, sometimes the squirrels, but bears love bird seed. Trash. That smell of garbage, absolutely amazing for bears. It's like they hit the <laughs> lotto. So, you know, eliminating all of those things helps. But if you do that and your neighbors don't, it really doesn't help because they're going to go through your yard to get to your neighbor's yard. So, you know, having kind of a coordinated effort in a neighborhood to minimize the food products would be the way to go, but it's more difficult than you think. If you grill something and there's a little grease in the grease pan on the grill or on the grates, bears will smell that. So it's often an exercise in futility, but trying to minimize it. The less food supply there is, the less the bears are going to have a reason to come around. And if you do see them, just leave them alone. They really don't want to bother you, and you shouldn't bother them. Gotcha. I think we have time for one more question, and we'll uh, toss this one to Amy. Uh, the listener asks, my dog doesn't like to have his teeth brushed. What are some ways I can make this more palatable or other strategies that can help with gum and teeth health? Yeah, excellent question. Dental care is certainly very important in our companion animals and is often very overlooked. Um, we do have the dentistry class in the veterinary technician program, and the students uh, learn a lot about dental uh, health and care for animals. And just like in people, animals may need to undergo dental cleanings and dental x-rays. Um, but things you can do at home to keep your pet's um, teeth and gums healthy are actually brushing. Um, that is the gold standard of care, um, but a lot of animals take a while to get adjusted to it. There certainly are several videos online, YouTube videos that you can watch on how to get your patient or your animal used to having their teeth brushed, but I like to tell people start by getting a very palatable uh, dental toothpaste that's veterinary supplied. So you don't want to use any human toothpaste. You certainly want to get something from your veterinarian. Uh, they come in like beef and fish flavors and things like that. And get a tube of that and just start by placing that on your finger and letting them lick it off. Get used to the that taste. Most actually really like it. And then you can start by getting your finger a little bit closer to the mouth, maybe actually in the mouth, um, and just kind of working your finger around with some of that toothpaste. Now, if you have an aggressive animal who doesn't like his mouth messed with, then that may not be the best option. Um, you can certainly try using um, a small, soft baby toothbrush uh, in lieu of your finger. But if you really want to do other things and you can't get you know, safely near your patient, your animal's mouth. You could try some additives to water. There are several water additives out there that you can actually pour into your patient, into your animal's water bowls. Um, that certainly will help. And there's certainly dental chews out there. So there are certain dental toys that you can get um, and uh, dental chews, chews that they can ingest that are shaped like X's and have lots of nubs and things like that on them. As they chew, they actually help uh, clean the teeth. Um, and any dental chew that you get for your pet, you know, make sure it's soft enough that you could almost indent it with your fingernail. If you give them anything too hard to chew on, we like, you know, like the, the antlers and things like that, those are too hard and can actually break and fracture teeth. So whatever chew toys you provide for your dog, just make sure you can, you know, dent it with your nail so that, you know, it's soft enough that it's not going to harm the teeth. So I just want to thank both you guys for doing this with me today. Yeah, of course. Oh, glad to do it. 